Um, according to my calendar, this is the 21st yacht sales in the law seminar. And looking back, I, I was at pretty much all, I think, I think I have been to all 21 of them. I was looking back and I, I can't find one that I missed. And I've spoken at several of them on certain things like contracts, broker liability and such. Um, the first one, in looking back, was at the Northern Trust Bank on Brickell Avenue in Miami. There were about 70 people there. Um, it was back in 1996 at the time I noticed that gas was $1.33 a gallon. Um, the Dolphins were three and one on their way to a pretty good season. Dan Danny Marino was still the quarterback. Um, a Clinton, William Jefferson Clinton was running for president. And Bob Zarkin was the president of the FYBA. I think not only is this group grown and the seminar grown, um, I think we've been through some good times, we've weathered some tough times, and I think we've had some fun and learned something along the way. And the theme of these seminars is always to give you as much information. I look at brokers as the first go-to person that a lot of times the owners are looking to, not just in the purchase and sale, but other aspects of owning a boat, operating a boat, dealing with other you know, contractors, vendors, and such. So some of the things having to do with arbitration of these contracts not only apply to you, but maybe questions you may get with regard to um, questions from owners. I think sometimes the brokers are the first call that they make and you want to answer that first question because you want to handle the little things. So when the big question comes, can you sell my boat again or I want to buy a new boat, you're there. Um, you know, it's difficult, you know, a lot of what we look at is the purchase and sale agreement. Your goal is to you know, find the buyer, get the buyer and the sell, you know, buyer and a seller together, get them in a boat and sell it. And that's difficult enough. Um, you don't need time to get mired in disputes or have problems. Um, but I think it's something you need to you know, look at and be ready for. If you look to the back of the contract and such, that's where you start seeing those, I call it the what if something goes wrong provisions. Um, since we're in a political season, it was Ben Franklin who said, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. It was true then and it's certainly true now. Um, I think also one of the things of these seminars just kind of lets you know, here's where there can be problems and things to look at. Um, my view on this is somewhat difficult, or somewhat different. I primarily, I practice maritime law and primarily involved with um, maritime litigation. And that's usually where something went wrong. Someone's not happy. Um, so when I think of contracts, I don't think of all the good things sometimes that you do in terms of buyers and sellers and getting commissions. I sometimes think of those bad things. I don't have all those happy thoughts that, you know, those Peter Pan, I can fly happy thoughts sometimes when I look at the contracts. I'm looking for, okay, where are the problems? In fact, none of you have ever called and written me and said, you know, we had a boat deal, it went perfectly. Everyone was happy, we were popping champagne, things were great, I wanna hire you to write to the other side and say what, how, what, what a wonderful experience it is. Never happened. Um, nope, I get, you know, sometimes the unhappy calls, I, you know, the people I work with who are in the buying and selling, they get the happy, they get the happy people, sometimes I get the less happy. So I want to talk about the contracts and frankly, more what I'll refer to as, you know, I'll give you the lawyer's perspective. These are the things, you know, as I said, when things go wrong, what I look for. And we're going to talk about the back pages of the contract. Some people refer to it the boilerplate, standard, normal. I like our contract, the FYBA contract. It's all contained in the area called miscellaneous. You don't know how that just brings joy to my heart to know that my topic is the miscellaneous. <laughs> but there's a commercial running for, uh, you know, for Liberty Mutual Insurance. I think it's one of the better ones running. And it's the one where there's the woman saying, did you read those 20 pages of your contract? No, only lawyers read that. You know, do you think they're gonna give you, you know, tow your car? No, it says blah, 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 blah. Nobody reads it. I think that is one of the truer words have never been spoken. I think that is, you know, it kind of sums up my whole view sometimes of these practice. But I think brokers and owners need to kind of, you know, look through those contracts so you have an idea what could happen should something not go according to plan. We talked just a few minutes ago about hurricanes and if there's a hurricane and, you know, that's probably when everyone is kind of going through the contract looking, okay, hurricane, act of God, okay, you know, force, force majeure. You know, can I either extend this, get out of it, get into it, keep it going, all of those times of issues. Um, and the one area, you know, one of the areas I want to start talking about is venue selection. Assume we have a problem. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be just an, under the purchase and sale agreement, can be any other problem. And 
you know, a lot of you just came back from Monaco. You're dealing with people, who, you know, a couple of weeks we're going to have the Fort Lauderdale Boat Show. People are coming in literally from all over the world to work with you, deal with you, hopefully buy a boat, take it back, and the contract may be entered here. But you're dealing with these contracts, and should something not go according to plan, then you are going to, you know, and if you have a dispute, the first question is, where is it going to take place? Um, a basic venue selection clause, and this is basically what it says, the venue for any arbitration or litigation shall take place in, fill in blank, Broward County, Florida. I like Broward County, we're all here. Um, think of basketball, you know, think of basketball, think of football. Home court advantage is not a term that began with basketball. Home court advantage is exactly what it sounds like. You want to be, if you have a dispute, you want to do it here. You want to sleep in your own bed, have your own office, park, you know, drive your own car. You want to ha make the other guy come here. I think it was Sun Tzu had one of those, if there's a, going to be a, a fight after a, a journey of a thousand miles, make the other guy make the journey. There's a lot of that here. You want to have it to take place. Um, you know, we, we talked about the FYBA contract and about two years ago it was redone and the, has a much more extended venue clause. And you, know, you can see it here, it's in the handouts and such. Um, any proceeding relating to this court we brought in the, in the state of Florida, the county of the main office of the selling broker or can fill it in. But the idea is to make it come here. Um, these can be, um, they can be permissive or they can be, you know, or they can be mandatory. More like, is it a rule or is it a guideline? As it's written here, um, and kind of in the second part of it, these are things where, you know, they are agreeing to come here. So wherever they are from, you, if there is going to be dispute, you want to have it here. You know, if you're not in, obviously if you're not in Broward County, you can pick your v venue. But a court is going to uphold that. A court is going to say, especially if it is written such a way like here where it is mandatory, you know, it's not, it's not really a choice. And they agreed to do it. So any court looking at it is going to say, Hey, you got you, you had a contract. You looked at the contract. You both agreed to come here. You know, it has been various times where someone has had a dispute and they bring a contract and you know, okay, let me see your contract. And I'm paging through the back and saying, it says we're, you know, venue is in New York, or London, or some other forum, and you're now saying, you know, what was in the back of the contract? The part that nobody reads. This is the time, just you know, the time to start reading it. Um, but they are enforceable, and should you have it in your contract and mandatory, any dispute's gonna wind up taking place here. You know, usually, I look at these clauses, as it said, miscellaneous, these are the ones that people, somewhere between, um, you know, name of the buyer, seller, price, how much date, rush to the signature page. These are those ones in the middle. Um, also, we have what's known as forum selection clauses. You get to choose your forum. Where are you going to do it? Forums in venue are fairly close, but forum is actually the courts in which it's going to take place in. Again, the, you, know, um, you can decide, you know, this, the courts of the state of Florida, the um, yeah, typical forum selection clause, you know, is, is one where it sets, you know, the jurisdiction of the Florida courts. We agree to the courts of the state of Florida to have exclusive jurisdiction. You're stating that these are the ones we're going to, you know, where we're going to have it, what we're going to do. Um, and the U.S. Supreme Court has looked at forum selection clauses and upheld them. And basically, in fact, this is a recent case in 2013, the forum selection clause is going to give controlling weight in all but, all but the most exceptional cases. And our cases probably aren't that exceptional. Um, the fact that someone has agreed to it, signed it, came forward with it, this is not necessarily a case of unequal bargaining power, you know, some big corporation against some small guy. Usually if it's someone on the other side of you, if it's someone who's buying a yacht, you know, I think that who, who's higher up the, or you know, someone who has, um, who's kind of higher up the food chain, maybe the buyer and not us. But again, as it, the Supreme Court said, they will rarely prevent a case from being transferred. Um, so if you are picking the forum or you're picking the court, they're probably gonna you know, uphold it. They're gonna keep it here. And that again is something you want to make sure you have chosen. If you wanna be in the state courts, you want you know, the state courts of Florida, put it in the contract. And we have, or the FYBI has put it in theirs. One of the next areas, and some of these seem very basic, and they all kind of run together, is a choice of law clause. You know, you look to, you know, what law is going to control. And a lot of these, a lot of contracts will say, you'll see a lot in charter contracts also as well, um, 
you know, the laws of the state of Florida, the laws of, this, you know, the, laws of the state of New York. A lot of insurance contracts will say the laws of the state of New York, and I'm thinking, I'm not in New York, my boat's not in New York, I'm not doing it, why are we doing it? Um, but it's something you need to look at. Um, a lot of them will say the, law, you know, the laws of, of, of England. Again, we're not in England, I'm not choosing to do it. If you have a chance to, you know, to negotiate it, to redo it, sometimes just change it, because I think the other side's not looking at it either. I think some of them are just using forms. And the clause is gonna be upheld, and, you know, in, in most, again, in most circumstances, because you, you agree to it. You know, out of our, con the FYBA contract, it says, you know, the contract will be interpreted exclusively under the laws of the state of Florida without regard to any conflict of laws principles requiring apl application of any other law. And it almost comes down to the phrase, hey, you guys made the deal, you agreed to it. This is how, we're, this is what we're going to do. We're going to use these laws. Um, one other point I also look at, we're beginning to see in more contracts, a service of process clause. Um, I'm seeing that in more contracts and I wanted to throw that in, in the sense, is if you have to go serve someone or someone has to serve you, a service of process clause is usually one where you agree that rather than having to go get a, serve, a process server, having to have them issue a subpoena, having them come to you, knock on your door in the middle of the night, come to your business, interrupt, you know, interrupt, you agree to accept it by, you know, email, fax, FedEx, something. This also works well, I think, going the other way because serving someone overseas can just be a pain in the neck. It is, can be in a time-consuming, expensive, you know, principle you have to go, you know, to the, the laws of their country, foreign rules, the Hague Convention. All of those things are things that you may not want to do. So if you can get them to agree, hey, if we're going to have a lawsuit arbitration or something, and all I gotta do is give you notice of it by sending it by email as opposed to hiring someone, it's a good deal all the way around. You may not want it. So, I mean, you may want to make them come to you, but more often than not, I think sometimes it's easier to get people here in Florida than it is there. Um, so, you know, those are the pages, you know, like I say, the miscellaneous pages, but these are the things people race by because you want to pick your forum, your law, your courts. You want to have it here. And one of the questions that some comes up in kind of the second half of this are all there are alternatives to lawsuits. Um, one of the issues that comes up is the Marine Council of Greater Miami is the, not only being the silent partner of this organization, but the Marine Council is also, I don't want to say the owner of, or, but has put together the, the Miami Maritime Arbitration Council. It has been, it was put together literally about 30 years ago. It operates by get, using local people to um, have or hold arbitration forums rather than going to overseas to London in one of or another forum. Um, very basically, marine arbitration in, in five minutes. Um, it allows, you know, arbitration's been around forever. You have salvage cases, you have salvage claims that were originally decided before there were courts. It was done with the idea of mariners would settle their differences between themselves. You know, we are all people in business, we are all in this business together. If it's think in the original times of ship owners, cargo owners and such, um, we will decide this amongst ourselves. We don't need to go to a court who doesn't know, who isn't in our business. And I think some of that is still true today. A part of the idea is you want people who know something about it. Um, someone always asks me, why do we want an arbitration clause? Well, my view is always because sometimes, sometimes things go wrong. You know, something, you, in the shipping business, in the, you know, this business, in the yachting business, there are, sometimes there are problems. So we want to set up some type of arrangement short of going to court. I mean, I, you know, going to court has its advantages, you know, you know you, but you have to get up early, you're on someone else's schedule, you have to wear a tie, you know, all of those things you may not want it. But arbitration sets you up in a way where you can run most of this yourself. A typical arbitration clause, you know, and basically sets up if there's any dispute, it'll be d decided by an, arb you know, in an arbitration um, in accordance with the rules or procedures of an organization, pick out what organization you, you want. Um, and probably most important, that the award will be final and be enforceable by any court having jurisdiction. You know, as it's, you know um, award shall be final, enforceable. So armed with an arbitration award judgment, why well, no, the arbitration does, award doesn't, uh, the arbitrators don't have their own sheriff's department, but the arbitrators can go out and have um, and it then goes to a court, and a court will almost literally rubber stamp it, saying, you agreed to this, this is what you wanted to do, um, and barring any type of just 
absolute fraud, the arbitrator was your brother-in-law, something along those lines, it's going to be automatically enforced. Um, there are, you know, and so what you would do beforehand, you know, you would select an arbitration panel. There are various organizations that will do this. Right now, probably the leading organizations are the Society of Maritime Arbitrators based out of New York, the London Maritime Arbitration, the, AB, or the AAA, which seems to be everywhere, and then, of course, the Miami Maritime Arbitration Council. Um, there are various good things and bad things about all of them. The first, I think the first part is, well, the first two are in New York and London. So we're back to that venue forum issue. The second, um, London arbitration is expensive. I'm you know, think, think of the difference between the pound, the dollar, um, you know, the, and if ever you had to do with, you know, with um, the legal business in London, solicitors and, and barristers are phenomenally expensive. Arbitra the arbitrators are phenomenally expensive. That is one of the reasons why first the Society of Maritime Arbitrators in New York and then later the Miami Maritime Arbitration Panel came into existence was the fact that we had clients who were tired of having to spend those kinds of dollars. But these are now you know, some of the main organizations. One of the questions that always comes up, why do, you, why do you want an arbitrator say than a judge? And it's true. If you're going to court, you can get judges. And we all hope we're going to get good, solid, learned judges. But this is a different business and you're not sure who you're going to get. You could get a whole different cast of characters in the judges. You know, I always say you could get these guys or you may wind up with this person. And these are the type of things, you know, you want to have an arbitrator. And it's really an idea of picking your own judge. You know, you and the other side agree on it, but you know, we get together and we say, okay, well, you know, Rob's heard of these kind of cases and he's a good guy and he knows all about this. Why don't we have someone who knows something about it rather than some judge, you know, who the first words out of his mouth is, you know, I've never really been on a big yacht or I've never really bought one, but they look really cool. And you're going, oh my God. Um, so you're getting, to pick your, you're getting to pick your judge and depending on the type of case, you know, a yacht purchase case, a cargo case, a personal injury case, you know, um, or you know, whatever it is, you got an idea, a better idea of what you're going to do. So if you're going through an arbitration, I'll kind of give you that kind of, you know, um, you look to your contract and you get a typical, you know, um, contract is you're going to start reviewing the contract and the contract usually that has an arbitration clause is going to set up, you know, what is to be arbitrated? Who's going to do it? What are the rules? How, you know, is there enforceability? You know, these are the, the you know, the first issues that are coming, you know, coming up on this. Um, so you look to the, you know, is there a con is in your contract an arbitration clause? Now I've said before, I've gotten involved with people and they've said, you know, there's an arbitration clause and it says we're going to London. You know, well, I never read that. Um, but some, some of the issues. Um, well, the second area is you look to, you know, um, after reviewing your contracts, you look to the rules of the organization. This one actually was arbitrated. Um, and you look, to the, you know, look to the rules of the organization. The organization has rules just like the inside of the box of Monopoly. You look it over and, you know, on, on side, underneath and you see this is how it's going to be set up. You're going to pick either one arbitrator or you can have a chase where you have three, you pick one, they pick one, and the two arbitrators agree on a middleman. Depending on the size, the dollars involved is going to be whether you're going to have an, you know, a, an one person or three person arbitrator. But it's something you agree to either beforehand or in the process. Yeah, probably the key, one of the keys in this is to having some type of control. Um, you're going to agree on a location. You know, where are we going to do this? You know, again, if it's in a venue, if there's a venue clause, you've already agreed. We're going to have arbitration and it's going to be in Broward County. So that, again, we're not traveling. You know, um, and then all the things you would do in any type of lawsuit, you know, or any type of dispute. I always say, you know, gather up all your documents, preserve your, you know, bills, photos, charts, times, all of those things. You want to set it forward as easily as possible so because you're going to have to present it to someone in order to prove your case, just as the other side. So it's a matter of gathering up, you know, documents, locate your witnesses, get all the documents together, all of those things. Um, I'm fond of saying, you know, a lot of these things and looking over the contracts or agreements are things that should be done beforehand. I always say this is not the time to all of a sudden start reading the contracts and deciding now what do we do. You should have a plan in place. You should know what's going to happen and such. Um, yeah, I know it's sad. Um, but these are the things you should have a chance to look at beforehand. Um, there are some very good things about arbitration with going to court. Um, and probably the first one and the things most people look to is a certain amount of privacy. When someone files a lawsuit, it is a matter of public record. Almost all um, arbitration panels are private organizations and it is not a matter of, private, uh, of public record. 
One of the things you'll see in a lot of charter contracts, virtually most of the charter contracts, the MEBA charter contracts, will ha all have um, arbitration clauses in it because they don't necessarily want their laundry in public. They don't, a lot of times, for those, obviously you, the charter brokers know, a lot of times they don't, you know, high net worth individuals don't want it advertised, hey, I'm going on this boat, and they sure as heck don't want it advertised, and now they're fighting with somebody because it just is, you know, that's why they wanted to charter the boat in the first place, to have that certain level of privacy. Um, I use the phrase it can be less con um, confrontational than a court proceeding. A little bit more relaxed, it's usually done in someone's office. Uh, it, it is not one where, you know, you know, you are going to court and you have a jury and all of those things. So it's a little less, con you know, you know, confrontational. It may not be one where, hey, can we all be friends afterwards, but I think you have a better chance. And in ongoing disputes where it may be one, or ongoing relationships, it may be one way to kind of keep the customer, builder's contracts, things like that. Um, you know, also, especially in the builder's contract area, they will say if we can, if they have a arbitration clause or something in it where a decision is made right away, Sometimes it's in a in builders' contracts. You see it, you know, you know, is this is the wood right? Is you know, do we use this kind, this kind, whatever? Let's get a surveyor. Let's get someone in there and make the decision right away. Or something. You know, so it the process can go on rather than stop, sue each other, let it go to court. We'll all hate each other afterwards. And the process, whatever it is, stop. That works well when there are ongoing business relationships. Obviously, you know, um, no, but it's, again, you are tailoring it, tailoring it to your relationship as opposed to a one-time client. Um, we've seen a couple where someone have said beforehand, hey, we have a dispute, we don't have an arbitration clause, but we don't really want to go to court, maybe we can set it up before, you know, just set it up and agree to go to arbitration. And the MAC has a kind of a simple contract, that's really the short form of it, but saying, hey, we agree, you know, we're agreeing to go to, you know, arbitration, you know, ahead of time. Because, you know, if it's an, think of a boat accident, think of a car accident, you're not planning on it happening, you're not even planning on meeting this person, so it's not like something you're going to have, an, you know, you're going to have an arbitration clause in place. Arbitration clauses are for people who have ongoing, continuing business relationships, or have, or have entered into a relationship, a purchase and sale agreement, a listing agreement, a charter agreement, and such. Um, but there are be becoming more and more times where people are agreeing, let's do this so we can keep it private, so we can keep moving, so we can do such things. Um, just on the side, some of the, I don't say current trends in terms of where arbitration is growing. Um, most, salvage case, you know, most salvage cases, most small boat salvage cases are an arbitration clause. Um, crew claims, certainly in the cruise ship industry, you are seeing arbitration clauses being put into contracts. We talked about before all the you know charter yachts, charter you know, agreements. It seems like they all have it. Builders repair um, contracts. I put yacht purchase and listing agreements. The FYBA current version does not have a um, an arbitration clause. Um, MIBA does. Yaba does. They seem to come and go. Ha you know whether you want to or not. Again, but it becomes a matter. It's your choice. Do we want to do it this way or not? I can sometimes look at if there's a theme in this. The second theme is this puts you in control. You know whether you want to have it or not. Um, I, you know I talked about salvage. Um, the typical Lloyd salvage form agreement when a boat goes aground, when the boat's in trouble, and the salvage boat shows up and says, "Hi, you're in trouble. Sign this." And it's not a case of, you know, or your boat can just sit there or something bad can happen or something. So you sign the agreement, the, the owner signs the agreement. And almost all of them, the typical Lloyds, have an arbitration clause in it. And it's not a matter of, you know, duress. Well, I wouldn't have signed it beforehand. Yes, but you wouldn't have needed me beforehand. But they're upheld. So the typical salvage contract, in fact, most of the or arbitrations, some of the small boat arbitrations seem to be matters of salvage. Um, crew claims. Again, crew claims are the ones where you're beginning to see um, not necessarily yacht claims, but the cruise ship business. Because they all belong to a union, because they're being hired, you know, hundreds of people at a time, they are signing contracts that all have arbitration clauses and they are being upheld all the way across. The typical cruise ship crew member claim is you know, out of Miami, out of Fort Lauderdale, is being arbitrated now. It's not going to court. And depending on your point of view, that's either a good thing or a bad thing, but it seems to be working. Um, I mentioned builders' issues, um, construction contracts, the idea where we have an ongoing relationship. 
and where if, some, if it is still going on, it's sometimes a matter of, rather than stopping the whole thing and suing each other, it's a matter of coming, you know, coming back and um, making a decision, moving on. Um, same thing, shipyard, you know, shipyard builders, repairs, um, there are good things and bad things about it, depending if you want it. Um, some shipbuilders are happy about it because they've already got the boat. Some repairers may not, if, who might rather seize the boat and hang on to it, sometimes may be less happy to have an arbitration clause. They sometimes, they want to make a point and seize the boat, have the U.S. Marshals come down, sticker the boat, and take it away. Um, but it, again, it's what you want to do. Um, and I, again, I mentioned yacht listing agreements. Some of them have them, some of them don't. Um, Yaba does, um, the, uh, you know, some of the ones are putting it in. Again, y'all, you know, that's a decision you can make and does it work for you. Um, again, it, it, you know, it depends on the choice. Um, one of the reasons, you know, and I think this is kind of a plug for the Miami Maritime Arbitration Council, they do have a set of rules and procedures in place. There, you know, there are, has local arbitrators who are familiar with local practices, you know, um, they know your, you know, some of them, you know, they know your business, they know the kind of things, you know, that you're doing, they, they know the layout. Um, I was at one a while ago and the arbitrator said, I've been on your side of the case, I've been on your side of the case, I've, you know, I've represented boat yards, I've taken my own boat to a boat yard, he said, I got, I know all of this, I, and I know your stories before it started. Um, I think that's a good thing, the idea that where you have someone who's coming in and knowing exactly what's, you know, how it's going. Um, the main reason, and one of the other reasons, I talked about privacy, but the other plan is to keep the costs down. If you can do this in such a way where you are not certainly traveling, you're not going to, you're not going to London, you're not going to, to, you know, to New York, but you're having local arbitration, that's a good thing. Um, same thing in terms of going to court. The idea being it is probably, there are some par parts of it, depending on the size of the case, where it is going to be less expensive. There's a caveat to that. Depending on the size of it, it can be, very, it can be expensive because not only are you paying your lawyer, and the other side may be paying their lawyer if you have one. Um, people have always asked me, do I need a lawyer in arbitration? And my answer is no, I'll never tell anybody they don't need a lawyer. But I will also never tell anyone they don't need a yacht broker, surveyor, insurance agent. One of my broker I worked for years ago had a sign up, if you're so smart, sell your own damn boat. And that was in the back of his, you know, in the back of his office. But, you know, arbitration can be, you know, if it's smaller, quick, um, uh, you know, fairly inexpensive. Um, it can be expensive if you have a three-person arbitration panel where you have not only you, 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 both sides are paying the, law, the lawyers, and generally there are lawyers, retired judges, some surveyors, we've had insurance people, you know, people who are on the panel. Um, but you may be splitting the cost of those three guys as well. At least when you go to state court, you know, a state court judge, you're not paying the judge. You're not supposed to be paying the judge, um, but I digress. Um, but you're not paying. You know, you're not paying for. You know, you're not paying for the court. So, you know, again, the idea is to keep the cost down. And as I said before, you, know, you want an arbitrator who knows something about it. In fact, the MAC is looking for people who are arbitra You know, to be who are interested in being arbitrators. People, you know, you know, and you want someone who knows something about it. We have lawyers, we have sailors, we have all of those people. And the arbitrator is going to, and the last thing people always ask about, one of the things people ask about is, many of you have been to mediation. Mediation and arbitration are different. Mediation is, hey, can't we just all get along? Can we make a decision? And a mediator will help you, you know, reach some type of an agreement. Think of a marriage broker, you know, or in the old days, or someone, you know, someone to help you get it together. An arbitrator, is going to make the decision. The arbitrator is the judge. You know, um, someone years ago we were des describing it to someone. Um, judge Judy is actually she was wearing a judge, but they sign an arbitration contract to actually go on the show. You know, she's you know, someone is making the decision. She's you know she's an arbitrator. She's make, making the call. Um, I mentioned before enforceability. Agreements to arbitrate are governed by the Convention for Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitration Awards. What basically that means is armed with an arbitration, either a foreign arbitration bringing it here and or a local arbitration bringing it to most of the countries you're going to deal with, that arbitration is recognized. So you don't have to go relitigated somewhere else. It can be used to enforce it. And frankly, I've had you know, in 
a lot of people talking about enforcing it, that it almost becomes easier because it again comes to, hey, you guys made this deal. You agreed to it. So a local judge or you know, a foreign judge may look at it and say, you went to an arbitration, you picked a panel, you signed up to do it, an agreement was made, we're not rehearing it. Um, the only decisions that generally come up sometimes is when a arbitration goes to court is sometimes where there is an instance where a, one side may file suit and the other side may say we have an arbitration agreement. In the packet, in the handout, there was a case about 10 years ago um, involving local, um, local yacht broker, a FYBA modif modified um, central listing agreement, and they were sued by an insur insurance company um, for damages to a boat, which they didn't do, but they were saying, well, it was kind of in your care and we're going to bring the suit. Um, we stood up on behalf of the you know, in, in, uh, in behalf of the broker, and we got an arbitration clause. You can't bring it to court. And the court looked at it and said, it's under the contract. The contract is broad enough. The clause is broad enough to say anything arising out of this arrangement, this arrived out of the arrangement, including the boat delivery. Therefore, goodbye. And then it became a question of whether they wanted to arbitrate or not. And frankly, the case went away because I think at the time they were trying to say, well, we're going to hold you up in court and that's going to be expensive. So we'll go to arbitration. It's a lot less expensive, and I think the insurance company said, uh, that's not worth the trouble. But the, and that was upholding one of the arbitration clauses that you know, you'll you know, it's put in the packet that we've used before, where the broker just, I got a clause. You can't, you can't bring a claim. You will sometimes see cases where someone will say, is what happened, whatever the dispute is, is it covered under the arbitration clause? And most of them are written pretty broadly. You know, any, anything happening under this relationship between two of us is going to be, you know, falls under it. I mean, I'm putting it very broadly, but most of them are intentionally written broadly. And most courts look at it to the point of saying, it's within, you know, this is what you contemplated. If you guys have a problem, go arbitrate, and more importantly, go do it in someone else's court or someone else's forum. Um, and that's the same thing when it seems an enforcement. Afterwards, almost all of them, you know, the, in, are enforced by the courts where someone goes to enforce it, there's almost, there is no appeal. There's no appeal at the arbitration level, and they, the courts will look at it and say, I am not reviewing this other than to see was there an arbitration, was there an agreement, was it a contract, goodbye. Um, so I guess the point of the story is, you know, have all the terms in place before the deal, you know, is reached. Look to the, in the contract, read the contract, Sometimes I think the other guy isn't reading it either. And if you look to those forum selection clauses, those venue clauses, where are you going to do it? You know, like, like I said, it's hidden somewhere away in the, away in the miscellaneous section of it. You know, they're in, you do not want to be surprised afterwards if there is a dispute and you say, we're all going to New York or London or somewhere else, or there's an arbitration or, you know, you want to know beforehand. You want to be able to bring this up be, you know, and have it laid out beforehand, or, or you could be left, you know, with the arbitration going, you know, or with everyone having to go somewhere else, and you are left here stranded waiting to go to court or to do something. So, as I said, you know, that's the backside of the contract. You know, we're going to have people later on this afternoon talking about fun things like going to Cuba or, you know, the, the more entertaining stuff. This may be the duller, you know, the duller part of the contract, and it hopefully it doesn't come up because you don't have any disputes but eventually you're gonna have one. And that's why you wanna have this in place beforehand. So thank you very much. Do you have any questions? <laughs> Peter. I'm oh, sorry, I saw your hand going up. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, my turn. Um, does anybody know why the FYBA contract doesn't have an arbitration clause? Um, it is, I, I'm not, you know, there are, like I said before, there are good reasons and bad reasons. I'm not going to stand here and, you know, you know, all for arbitration and such. I mean, there are certain things I, I like about it, certain things I don't. But it's a matter of choice. I mean, it was, ta it was in. I'm not exactly sure why. But it is something you can put in or take out, ha you know, as you want. I don't want to, I'm not trying to rewrite the contract. I actually think they did a very good job on a lot of the thing, you know, on it. Um, I thought, the, and since this is the last thing, I decided to go study the forum selection clause, the venue clauses and such. Um, I thought it did an excellent job in terms of making it not, you know, very mandatory to, if, there's, if there's such a word. Um, 
you know, take, I was gonna say, take it up with, with the people who did it, but if it's something you want, you can add it. If it's something you don't want, you don't have to add it. I think my point in this is, make sure you know that one, there are such things, two, they are in a lot of the contracts that may pass through your hands, three, if you want one, put it in, but don't get blindsided by turning to the back pages once something goes wrong and saying, hey, this charter agreement has an arbitration clause in London. So that's up to you. It's kind of a dodge, but. I wasn't advocating it. it should be there or shouldn't be there. I just was wondering, I'm sure it's been discussed. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Michael. Yeah, Peter. Yeah. yeah. Um, you mentioned that um, arbitration can preserve privacy, but um, where the, 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 um, there's an accident investigation takes place, um, and perhaps insurers are involved, do these parties have the right to attend an arbitration proceeding? Um, and when you said accident, ac actual ac flag, accident investigators? If, if the flag is running an accident investigation, for example, um, does it have the right, or does its officer appointed have the right to attend arbitration proceedings? I will, one of the main things about arbitration, it is an agreement between the parties, so those, and since it is not public record, anybody can walk into a courtroom, the parties can deter, say, I don't want these guys here. So I guess the answer to your question is, do they have a right? My answer is no. Now the caveat to that may be, you know, is there an insurance company who may want to be involved if it's an insurable issue? Just like, you know, they may want to take control, you know, take control of it if there's, you know, an insurable def defendant. They may have, you know, I don't know if they have a right to be there, but if they're my insurance company, I certainly want them there um, because they're maybe the ones paying for it at the end. But no, that level of privacy is something that you can keep it a closed door um, event. And that's really one of the main parts of it. Um, a lot of the, and then a lot of this may happen if there was a, you're thinking more of a, a tort or a crash or something along those lines, where a lot of times Coast Guard investigations, National Transportation Safety Board investigations, a lot of those may happen beforehand. Um, but my answer is if the parties don't want it, you're not invited. So you could have a situation where um, the decision under arbitration could vary from the findings of an accident Report. Well, yes, I, I guess that may be, because the decisions of an arbitration panel are usually based on something that happened in a contract. You do not see it as much in terms of a, an, you know, an accident relationship. If you, you know, I'm going boating this weekend, you're going boating in this weekend, I'm not planning on running into you, literally. So you and I haven't signed an agreement, hey, if anyway we hit each other out in the bay, bay this weekend, we'll arbitrate it. So most of those governmental, um, investigations usually come out of some sort of accident where there was no pri prior relationship. As long as you have an arbitration clause, you don't have to have a venue clause, correct? Well, a lot of them will do the same thing or work it in. I mean, ours, some of them are sometimes a little bit run together where the typical venue clause may well be any proceeding. And if you're gonna have an arbitration clause in it, I would certainly put in it, any arbitration proceeding will take place, fill in blank. So that way there is no doubt when reading it, because you could say we're having an arbitration under the rules of the Miami Maritime Arbitration Council, but it doesn't say, say where, it doesn't have to be in Miami. I mean, but it's, I guess my recommendation is do both. You know, any proceeding, legal proceeding. Um, and also there are sometimes a legal proceeding brought, let's say I bring you into, our, you know, I bring you into an arbitration and either you don't wanna go there or you bring a claim, you still are gonna have to have a proceeding here in where, Florida or wherever that venue clause is. So short answer, do both. Yeah. How would you do both if you're doing, in other words, I've got an arbitration clause in my contract. Yes. Miami Maritime Arbitration, okay? Anything proceeding, and so basically, wouldn't that dictate the venue? It certainly, it does, but you know, I'm one of those pants and suspenders, or belt and suspenders types, where you would put the next line, maybe any arbitration proceeding will take place in fill in blank. 
So that way there's no doubt. The, the arbitration clause in and of itself is more of a forum selection clause. We have decided to settle our dispute by arbitration. The venue clause is where we are going to do it. Um, and that way, if you would rather it be here, say so up front. In regard to the MEBA charter agreement where they call for arbitration, yes. um, if you have a U.S. owner and a U.S. client, is it enough to say arbitration will take place in a mutually agreeable location within the United States? And how does that apply to that agreement, which is very much written about London law? Two things. Somewhere in the United States is a pretty big area. And mutually agreeable, if we're, if we're mutually agreeable, we, w we may not be here in the first place. I don't think we're going to agree on where we're going to lunch today or something like that. How are we going to agree on where this is going to happen? So, yes, you may have a venue clause and you have, you know, 50 states and three territories where you can take, where it can happen. I would tailor it down to Broward County, Florida, or, you know, or something along those lines. Um, in the second part, you had said under what law. You can have a venue clause saying we are going to do it here, but we are going to do it under the laws of Florida, New York, England, France, wherever. Though, you know, one why doesn't necessarily follow the other. One is, can be merely location. There are, you know, there are a thousand insurance cases going on where they're saying, hey, we're doing it here, but it's the laws of New York. Um, so you want to pick what you want and get it into the agreement, but you could very well have be doing it here uh, under English law. Does that make sense? So, so just, to, just to make sure, if you had two U.S. parties that signed amoeba agreement and you said, should arbitration be necessary, it will take place in Miami under the MMAC. That, that determines your location, but they can actually arbitrate according to the laws of that contract or the terms of that contract? Yes, I, I guess is the short answer. You know, the venue clause and the, you know, is gonna set where? Think of geography. The, the forum clause more of, you know, courts of, the you know, courts of the state of Florida, an arbitration proceeding, where, you know, what courts are you going to do it and such. So you're kind of setting both of them up. And the choice of law is we're going to use Florida law, we're going to use English law, we're going to use New York law. So all of those you want to go forward and set up. I mean, you can kind of mix and match them, but at that end, it, yeah. Yeah, two, two quick ones uh, that could be yes and no's. Uh, insurance underwriters, do they have a preference? Uh, whether to go to arbitration or court? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> and then that's uh, a good question. I mean, I, I, I'm I looking for Nancy and saying help, please, or something yeah, along those lines. I'll ask Nancy. Yeah. Um, and then uh, switching away from arbitration, uh, court. You didn't mention federal. You know, the clauses said Broward County, Florida, blah 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 blah. What about federal court uh, as a venue? Um, you can, there is actually some continuing litigation going on it, but you can specify state court, you know, state courts and I say generally win it. Um, federal courts, you know, in order, federal courts being limited jurisdiction, you have to have diversity of citizenship, people from two other places. So two Florida people cannot just show up in a federal court. Um, purchase and sale agreements are not a matter of maritime law. Seems crazy, but you know, it's not in and of itself gets you into federal court purely as an admiralty issue. So, you know, we, in fact, some people thought about that the idea let's put in the purchase and sale agreement only to be held in the federal court, and then you go to federal court and the judge says, hey, it's a purchase and sale agreement, it's not under admiralty, you have no jurisdiction, go away. You know, it's not going to happen. You know, so, but a lot of times people will say, I, I want to put it into a state court. Local judges, you know, I know the judge, he knows me, you know, whatever. Some people, you know, some. Some people are more comfortable in either setting. I gotta tell you, I went, to, I went for the first time in my career to small claims court for a boat owner issue. And it, I will never make fun of Judge Judy again. The stuff on television was nothing compared to what was going on in that room. I would, you know, I, was, I would have paid, I, I never wanna go back, but it was worth, you know, I would have paid to have sat there and listened to this circus. Um, 
you know, some people are more comfortable in federal court. It's much more orderly. They have a set of rules, they have such things. Some insurance companies are much more, because they like the way it's set up, and there's sometimes an intimidation factor and such. But you can set your form. Michael, quickly, um, I might have missed this, but how are, quickly, how are arbitrators chosen? Um, first, b by the panel to be an arbitrator or be by the two parties? By the two parties, how is, how is that panel established? Um, two, two ways. Um, first way is various organizations have a list of these are the arbitrators we know and love, and you can pick them off the list. Having said that, a lot of arbitrators will say, if you and I want to use Rob, we can agree. And that becomes, and that kind of the final thing is, we agree. Arbitration is you are settling your own problems, or at least as much as you can by picking that person you want to settle your problems. So if, and if in a three-person panel, um, where there are three arbitrators, you pick yours, I pick mine, and those two guys go, well, you like this guy, this guy, this guy, who do you want? You know, and they pick it. But again, it's a matter of choice on your part. And that's kind of the punchline to the whole thing. And fees for arbitrators are on a scale, correct? Correct. Um, a lot of, you know, the smaller ones, some of the organizations will have, will set a fee. I saw Mike Moore, I think, earlier. Mike has some great stories about going to London where they just kind of picked a number out of the sky because it was a huge case. Um, more often than not, it's done on an hourly. Just, you know, it's a small matter, you know, if sometimes lawyers may charge some, like almost like any other case, where they just set a bill or set an hourly bill. Thanks, Mike. I want to reflect quickly on Nicole's question about the MEBA contract, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, going back, dusting off the memory banks here, that there is some sort of language, or as mutually agreed upon, or something like that, if I'm not mistaken. And also, yeah. uh, I, in, in, in cases that I've been involved with in arbitration, even though it may have been the venue, London, I think after the fact, if there's a dispute, both sides can agree, mutually agree, to waive the London arbitration and bring it to wherever they mutually agree right. to have it. So. Yeah, and that, you know, like I said, coming back to that punchline, if we agree to d resolve our own problems and we will do it. Um, but if I'm from London and you're from Miami, we ain't mutually agreeing. You know, or we're doing it in London because you signed something, or vice versa. We may mutually agree to do it here. If we're both from Florida, and you read it and say, who agreed to London? <laughs> you know. Well, the contract obviously is done beforehand. That mutually agreement can be done later. But again, you don't want to be on the wrong side of it when all of a sudden someone is saying, hey, I'm, you know, come to my hometown, you know, see in London, if you're from Miami. So, thank you. Thanks.